they will be entering right now. For your own. Okay, I think we we are ready to start. Mariana, all set? Okay, warmest greetings, friends, and wishing you all a meaningful new year. I am Corazon Valdez Fabras from the Philippines and from the International Peace Bureau. I am deeply honored to co-moderate this conference today with Jeroen Bernard. Jeron, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Cora. Um, indeed, my name is Jeroen uh, Bernhardt and I work on policy and actions uh, related to struggles for peace, democracy and rights at the International Trade Union Confederation. And uh, from our side, wishing you all a peaceful new year um, from over 200 million working people um, and 332 national trade union centers in 160 countries. On behalf of the organizers, I welcome you to the Peace and Planet online international conference. We thank you for your presence and solidarity as we together begin the year with stronger determination and commitment to pursue a world free of nuclear weapons. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty came into effect in 1970 with the promise of creating a nuclear weapons free world. More than 50 years hence, the nuclear powers have refused to fulfill their part of the bargain, leaving humanity hostage to accidents and miscalculations that could end civilization. Our conference is being held against the backdrop of many challenges that we all face in our communities. Close to 100 billion US dollars of public funds are spent annually on nuclear weapons at the expense of urgent human needs and investment in common security. We dare to ask the big question, why is this continuing to happen? Without a strong multilateral commitment to nuclear disarmament, this will continue to rise indeed. With new nuclear arms races, confrontations over Taiwan, Ukraine, the South China Sea and Kashmir, the stakes for the review conference and the world couldn't be higher. Yet the bar that diplomats have set for a successful NPT review conference couldn't be much lower. To send a powerful message to the UN, despite another postponement of the review conference and to build our national as well as international abolition and peace movements, the Peace and Planet Network has organized this online conference today. We are fortunate to have distinguished movement leaders engaged scholars, analysts who will share their expectations for the review conference and spell out what our governments must do to ensure full implementation of the NPT and creation of a public of a nuclear weapons free world. Two hours wouldn't be enough to cover all grounds that need to be addressed, but let this be 
a beginning of a fruitful and meaningful year for our movement. And as we gather today, let us remember those who have gone ahead of us, whose lifelong commitment inspired us to continue to be engaged meaningfully and courageously. Our speakers, um, our speakers will make a five minute presentation at the end of each panel. Um, we will have a Q and A to address questions for clarification and discussion. We request that you use the Q and A box at the bottom of your screen instead of the chat box. You can use the chat box for comments and information that you might like to share with everyone. In the interest of time, we will give a short introduction for our speakers and their longer bio will be pasted, posted on the chat box. This conference is being recorded and we will make available and it will be made available through the different websites and social media accounts of the organizers. Um, let me now hand it, this over to uh, Jeroen, uh, my colleague, who will uh, continue and move on to introducing our speakers. Thank you Jeroen. very much, Cora. Yes, I think with that, all is clear. Uh, further questions or comments can always be dropped in the chat section throughout the conference. Um, but I think this is uh, enough from us. It's high time to start listening to our series of eminent speakers. And it is a particular privilege to introduce our first speaker, um, as Liv Torres has just taken up her new role as the International Secretary of the Norwegian Confederation of Trade Unions, LO Norway. Until the end of last year, she was the director of the Pathfinders for Peaceful, Just and Inclusive Societies at New York University, building on her earlier experience at the highest levels in Norwegian politics. Um, she is also a commissioner for the Common Security 2022 initiative, revisiting all of Palma's legacy with an outlook to the future. Liv, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much and good morning, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are. Now, we are at a critical time, basically. I think we're all aware of that. We have less than 100 seconds to midnight on the doomsday watch. And when I got into this work and engaged as an activist 10 years ago, uh, we had five minutes to midnight. So it tells us two things. One is that we are running out of time. Two is that we are on the road in the wrong direction. So we need to mobilize. Our time is running out, basically. Now the 2022 NPT review conference is delayed, but we've got no time to delay the issues we have at the table here today. We need to mobilize and the setting is sobering. We have global tensions that have been increasing over the past decade. We have unrest increasing in parallel with democracy being suppressed, human rights being suppressed in many places. We have violence increasing, radicalization. And all of this on the background of climate change uh, polarization and increasing inequality between and within countries. And we know what happens when inequality is increasing. Stability is also under pressure. I should mention, not the least, last but not the least, the fact that the global arms race is also speeding up and has for a while. Now, most of our leaders say that they want peace. 
most of the global leaders. And it's spectacular how their strategies and tactics are basically moving in the other direction and contradicting, in many cases, the very visions and goals that they are underlining. The nuclear powers are spending trillions of dollars to upgrade their nuclear arsenals and delivery systems. We see increasing great power tensions in several uh, areas. Ukraine and Taiwan was mentioned by Cora earlier. And we see current arms race with focus on high level technology, which also stimulates and pushes other actors potentially to invest in deterrence. Now, some experts say that we are lucky if we survive more than a few decades without another Nagasaki or Hiroshima. So when the expectations are raised to the NPT 2022 conference, I would like to mention three points, basically. The organizers of the, co of the conference we are now part of will have published their demands. They are loud and clear. My expectations are as follows. That global lead leaders, point number one, start acting according to the goals and visions. If they say, and when they say they are pro-peace, then act accordingly, do more. Secondly, respect the NPT obligations. And thirdly, listen to their own people because people do want peace. They do not want armament, arms races and, and war. So that's basically my expectations to the NPT review conference. And we have engaged in disarmament before. We know how it's done. We've seen several treaties we have seen initiatives, the Iran deal. We have seen the, the uh, ban on nuclear weapons. And 10 years ago, the Oslo Conference on the Humanitarian Impact of Nuclear Weapons basically paved the way to that very same ban on nuclear weapons that was agreed in the UN some few years ago. And it shows us a few things. It shows us that small states and groups of small states together with civil society can actually spearhead global change and disarmament. So when we mobilize, we, we mo must mobilize and run our advocacy campaigns both towards the superpowers as well as towards other states and leaders. The NPT conference in 2015 failed to produce an outcome. We cannot let that happen again. We are running out of time. We are running in the wrong direction. And the few seconds we have left, we need to make each and one of them count by mobilizing heavily on our side, organizing properly and do what we have done before, spearheading real change in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. That was a powerful opening, very challenging and clear cut statement of um, the message that you'd like to send to the UN uh, for the review conference. Um, and I, I think that um, uh, following that lead, <laughs> which is not, uh, uh, which is uh, important for, for all of us to begin this conference, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Alexi Gromyko, uh, uh, who will, uh, who is a corresponding member of the Russian Academy of Sciences and the director of the RAS Institute of Europe. And currently he is executive editor of a journal, the Social Sciences and Contemporary World. Um, Alexei, the floor is yours. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Uh, for me, this is a great uh, opportunity to be in such a splendid uh, company on the fourth day of the new year. And uh, um, for me, this is a great uh, opportunity to share with you some of my thoughts <clears throat> on the topic. Uh, I think that in terms of non-proliferation and European security, 2021 was a gloomy year. And uh, the end of the year was especially disturbing. Uh, the United States and NATO were faced with uh, the red lines and uh, clear-cut proposals from Russia how to de-escalate the situation in their relations. And that was uh, in addition to positive, although incremental developments in the sphere of the strategic stability dialogue between uh, Moscow and uh, uh, Washington. Uh, but in uh, contrast, yesterday, uh, the 3rd of uh, January brought us uh, surprisingly good news. The leaders of the five nuclear weapons states made a joint statement on uh, preventing nuclear war and avoiding arms races. And few uh, experts expected <laughs> this uh, statement um, to be put so early uh, in the beginning of the year. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that by now, uh, <clears throat> uh, all who are uh, present in the room has had a chance uh, to read it. Uh, besides other themes, it directly relates to the non-proliferation issues. Uh, for example, P5 remain committed to the NPT obligations, including the uh, Article 6 obligation to pursue negotiations in good faith um, on cessation of the nuclear arms uh, race at uh, an early date uh, and to nuclear <clears throat> disarmament. Uh, at the same time, this important statement does not compensate for all the accumulated problems. The defense budget of Joseph Biden surpasses the last defense budget of Donald Trump. In 2020, the United Kingdom sharply raised the ceiling of its nuclear warheads. There is a moderate probability of a radical increase in the number of uh, Chinese ISBMs, uh, which, well, which may make the uh, Russia-US dialogue on the future of strategic uh, stability a much harder exercise. Uh, just to recall that within this dialogue, the United States wants to count all strategic and non-strategic nuclear weapons, and Russia wants to include all uh, offensive and, and defensive nuclear and non-nuclear strategic weapons. Um, uh, emerging and disruptive and this um, <clears throat> disruptive technologies is uh, another complication. Uh, hypersonics are a real concern in case if such systems are deployed in the proximity of Russia or member states of NATO. And the same uh, relates to the new INF systems, which the United States quickly develops. Uh, in the eyes of Moscow, the chances are high of a new Euro missile crisis exploding in the next years if Russia's uh, proposals on uh, a moratorium on a land base based INF in Europe are not responded to. And just let's imagine that the United States moves its technical nuclear weapons eastward, for example, to Poland, and Russia responds with technical nuclear weapons in Kaliningrad or in. Belarus. Uh, in the worst scenario, the deterrence doctrines of Russia and the United States may change from a counter or a second strike capabilities to a preemptive nuclear war fighting doctrine. Um, <clears throat> then the uh, corrosion of the non-proliferation uh, regime 
occurs due to more risks, for example, inherent to the AUKUS agreement, the uh, United States uh, strategy of a nuclear, uh, sorry, of a new Cold War with uh, China envisages the uh, involvement of India in the uh, anti-Beijing military uh, bloc. Uh, if, this if this happens, this will inevitably spur a nuclear arms race between Delhi and Beijing, and Pakistan would uh, also be inevitably involved. Uh, the more the official nuclear powers compete with each other, the less they can coordinate their efforts in stemming the proliferation, for example, on the Korean Peninsula, and the less they can work on the return of the US to the GCPOA. Uh, and by the way, meanwhile, uh, Iran is raising the enrichment of uh, uh, uranium to 60%. Uh, um, besides the recent P5 statement, is there a silver lining in the cloud? Well, I think that on the coattails of the statement, it will be easier to convene a P5 conference as was agreed in 2020 before the pandemic struck. In Vienna, the talks on the GCPOA should move forward with an, with an active support of the United States, which is responsible for the current crisis. Uh, the return of the US and Iran to the deal would diffuse a looming nuclear arms race in the Middle East, uh, including Iran, Saudi uh, Arabia and Israel. Um, the United States and NATO should strive to work with Russia on achieving mutual uh, guarantees of, secu of security, ruling out deployment of nuclear or uh, conventional strike systems in the proximity to uh, one another. Uh, and only the United States and Russia working together in goodwill can persuade China to refrain from destabilizing steps with respect to its nuclear arsenal. On its part, China should Mm, clarify if there are changes in its nuclear doctrine which breach its non-proliferation uh, obligations. And as to nuclear doctrines of the United States and Russia, the next uh, Neither statement statement may just would be to proceed to embrace the sole purpose criterion uh, which is uh, understood on the posture no first. So from my point of uh, some uh, elements of stabilization or uh, proliferation or issues, which, uh, which we can uh, expect, which uh, 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 can emerge in 2022 if all sides uh, in good will uh, and really strive to um, cessation of, of, of the arms races uh, and further risks of, uh, of proliferation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexei. Uh, and, and sorry, I, I think that the, uh, the connection got cut up a little bit at the end, but we got uh, the, um, a large part of your uh, intervention. Thank you very much for um, these important insights in the developments. Uh, in relation with Russia and the heightened risks, the um, the nuclear weapon state statement is indeed um, very positive. But you also explained the the recent developments that do not match that statement. As Liv put it earlier, I think it's important for all of us that we'll have to monitor further government actions and and hold them to account against the declaration. Um, um, I think it's clear that governments have to act uh, in line. Um, I'll, we're moving to Japan um, for the next speaker. 
Yayoi Tsushida is Associate General Secretary of the Japan Council Against H and H Bombs. Jen Sui Kyo, uh, long a leading member of the Japanese peace movement. She works closely with A Bomb survivors, organizes international conferences, and represents Jen Sui Kyo um, internationally. Yayoi, thank you very much for joining it at this very late hour for you. Um, we look forward to your intervention. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. It was unfortunate that the NPT review conference was postponed again. However, we issued a statement in which we demand that the Article 6 obligation and all past commitments concerning the ban and elimination of nuclear weapons be implemented without any further delay. We also, we also call on all the governments to support the TPNUW or to set out any other action alongside as part of the special efforts to establish a framework to achieve a world without nuclear weapons. The P5 joint statement became a top topic in Japan today. I want to tell them that their foremost responsibility is to take action to prohibit and eliminate nuclear weapons. We have to make them break away with the nuclear deterrence. In spite of being the only able country, the Japanese government has opposed to the TPNW and is sticking to be under the US nuclear umbrella. In the intensifying hegemonic competition between the US and China over the South China Sea and East China Sea, the US promised Japan to use all kinds of US capabilities, including nuclear, to support Japan's defense. In response, Japan promised to make military buildup and mobilize self-defense forces in the event of a Taiwan emergency. Reliance on nuclear deterrence only increases the risk of endless arms race, war, and the use of nuclear weapons. In this regard, the TPNW empowers us. Nuclear weapon states and dependent states say that the TPNW divides the international community or it is ineffective without joining of any nuclear armed states. Yet the rejection of their joining the TPNW is not the fault of the treaty. It was simply due to the fact these states still believe in nuclear weapons as a guarantee of their security. More than 120,000 surviving Hibakusha are still suffering from mental and physical injuries. How come preparation for another Hiroshima or Nagasaki can be a guarantee of safety? The TPNW has brought drastic change to us about 70 to 80% of people in nuclear weapon states and umbrella states welcome the treaty and call for their government's accession to it. In Japan as well, 71% support Japan's accession to the treaty and 85% want its participation in the first meeting of the treaty in March. We are also encouraged by the decision of the new governments of Norway and Germany to join the first meeting as observers. In the general, in the general election held in Japan last year, four opposition parties unitedly appealed for a government change and Japan's ratification of the treaty and its observer participation were included in the common policy of a new government. We called for public support for creating a government joining the treaty. Unfortunately, the transition of power did not happen, but we could lay the groundwork for pushing the TPNW up on the political agenda. Nuclear weapon states are being cornered by these moves. The Kyodo News reported on December 20th last year that the Biden administration had officially requested Japan not to participate in the first meeting as an observer. The prohibition and elimination of nuclear weapons cannot be achieved 
without that, without the development of public opinion and movement in each country, in particular in nuclear armed states and dependent states. This year, we want to make a grand leap forward of the signature campaign to put the maximum pressure on the Japanese government to ratify the TPNW. Let's work together to make these states break away with the nuclear deterrence and support and ratify the treaty. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Yayoi. Um, that is a, an important uh, contribution that you made and uh, the ongoing um, uh, earnest campaign, uh, not only in, uh, in Tokyo, but in the whole of Japan. Japan for the Japanese government to finally ratify the TPNW. It's that uh, an important and admirable work. And we join you in solidarity in that important work. Uh, we will now move on to uh, our next speaker. And I'd like to call on uh, Sarah Medi Jones of the uh, uh, UK campaign for nuclear disarmament. She is currently the campaign's director and is also a council member of the International Peace Bureau. Sarah? Hi everyone, thank you Cora and thank you to Peace and Planets for inviting me to speak today. I'm delighted that we can still be here discussing these very important topics, even though the review conference itself has been postponed yet again. So in the five minutes I have today, I will try just to provide an update from a UK perspective. So as was referred to by a previous speaker, it is bad enough that the UK has not only signed up to the NPT over 50 years ago and is making no moves to disarm, but they've now made a new announcement last year that has made the situation even worse and shown the government's complete disregard for the NPT. In March 2021, the government published a long-awaited integrated policy review of security, defence, development and foreign policy. Now, it was a shock to everyone across the board, pro or against nuclear weapons, that this document included a commitment to increase the UK's nuclear arsenal for the first time since the Cold War, and this by 40%. The document also included a change in use posture, so the government will now consider using nuclear weapons in response to non-nuclear threats. This could mean a cyber attack, for example. The government has also rejected transparency and will now no longer give any public figures for the nuclear weapon system. This will, of course, make it even harder for us to scrutinize the cost of developing these weapons of mass destruction. So CND, we immediately responded, arranging protests and actions. And one of the things we did was we commissioned a legal opinion by experts from the London School of Economics, which after a lot of work and research, concluded that this announcement, this increase in the nuclear warhead arsenal is a breach of international law, specifically the MPT. So we took this legal opinion just before Christmas to a meeting with the president of the upcoming review conference. Ambassador Gustavo Slavinen, he congratulated CND on our work, read the legal opinion, and we discussed ways forward for our mutual aim of achieving a world without nuclear weapons. Now, we now sincerely hope that the UK government's breach of the treaty, alongside all the other nuclear armed states, of course, none of which are honouring their commitments, can be raised whenever this review conference does now take place. Because as the last two years have shown us, nuclear weapons will not keep us safe in the face of the real threats we face today. In fact, in terms of national security, nuclear weapons are irrelevant. We all know the world is reeling from a coronavirus pandemic that has changed all our lives. And it's an indisputable fact that governments such as the UK should have been more prepared. They were warned. The UK's 2015 national security strategy even highlighted pandemics as a tier one threat. 
nuclear wasn't in that bracket. But this analysis was not reflected in the government's policies. So on one hand, we don't have enough personal protective equipment for nurses during a pandemic. We don't have enough ventilators to keep people alive, but we have 200 useless nuclear bombs. So this exposes a flaw in the government's strategic thinking. The concept of true security in the 21st century needs to be re-evaluated by the UK government and governments across the world. Climate change and its repercussions also poses a serious threat to international stability. Ensuring our security is no longer centered on military scenarios, but rather on increasingly complex and ever-changing factors. And most of the world does actually understand this. Um, I saw someone in the chat had raised the TPNW, and this is a very important development. The Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons was supported by 122 countries at the UN. This agreement has now entered into force, and what it does is make nuclear weapons illegal in the countries that sign it. But of course, the UK has acted shamefully yet again in regards to this agreement. They refused to participate in the negotiations and even issued a hostile statement attacking it. So as a next step, CND is launching a campaign later this month to get the UK to attend the first meeting of the state's parties to the TPNW just as an observer. This is a vital first step in the government here engaging with what is a crucial development in the campaign for a world without nuclear weapons. Britain should view disarmament as an opportunity. Getting rid of its nuclear weapons system could not only provide political leadership to the rest of the world, or sorry, the rest of the nuclear armed states, but could be a practical guide for how to do it, a blueprint for the rest of the world. Because we don't have any time to waste. The threat of nuclear war is higher than it has been in years. There is a danger that misunderstanding, miscalculation or mistakes could lead to the use of nuclear weapons. And the P5 do understand this. The statements they issued yesterday on preventing nuclear war, of course, needs to be welcomed. But surely they understand, surely they realise that the only way to actually prevent nuclear war is by getting rid of these weapons completely. The UK, as well as all the other nuclear armed states, need to stand by their commitments to disarmament and remember that they are signatories of the NPT. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. We, we indeed uh, share your concern over the UK's commitment to increase uh, its nuclear arsenal. Without any transparency and democratic checks for these public investments, as, as you say, at a time that the pandemic is still not under control and causing avoidable deaths. That's clearly unacceptable. Congratu congratulations on your actions in the country. Um, and uh, all of us, I'm sure, are ready to join and support your campaign activities uh, in the future. We're moving back to Asia now, where um, Tai Ho Lee is a leading civil activist in South Korea. He is a chair of the policy committee and a director of the Center for Peace and Disarmament of the PSPD. That stands for People's Solidarity for Participatory Democracy, a watchdog NGO in Seoul. He also serves as co-chair of the steering committee of the civil society organizations network in Korea with over 300 members. Tai Ho, you have the floor. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Uh, the, the historic TPNW became live last year. However, the armed race and conflict in the Indo-Pacific region an area where the nuclear armed state are uh, concentrated is undermining any vision for a uh, world free of uh, funds. Centered around the political, military, and economic conflicts, which the US has labeled uh, US China strategic uh, competition, nuclear, uh, nuclear armed states such as Russia, the UK, and India are increasing their nuclear weapons in the name of military alliances or military cooperation. The US is enhancing its nuclear arsenals. The US and the UK announced that they plan to assist Australia in acquiring nuclear power submarine uh, through the AUKUS alliance. 
China is strengthening its military cooperation with Russia in the Western uh, Pacific region, whilst increasing its nuclear weapons stockpile with a justification of its compensating for its inferiority in nuclear capability when compared to the US. In the midst of this uh, vortex uh, lies the nuclear problem on the Korean Peninsula, where well, the armistice has continued for more than 70 years. The precarious armistice on the Korean Peninsula and the DPRK nuclear weapon and missile program are serving as catalyst for the nuclear and conventional arms race in the region, along with the problem of the Taiwan Strait. There have been several opportunities to block the DPRK's ambitions to develop nuclear weapons and fundamentally resolve the uh, nuclear issues in the Korean Peninsula following the end of Cold War. However, several important agreements were not implemented. Uh, please refer to the presentation document for the detailed reason. Uh, when the US DPRK negotiation process starting in 20, uh, 2018, it was considered to be the last chance to prevent the DPRK from possessing nuclear weapons and to be an important momentum towards stopping the international tide moving toward a new Cold War order. However, the negotiation have been stalled following the collapse of talks about the level and scope of corresponding measures at the DPRK US Hanoi summit in February 2019. While negotiations are halted and sanctions continue, the DPRK nuclear material stockpiles are increasing and its means of delivery improving. Time is short. We need to find the fundamental solution to the problem. First three, a uh, strategy centered on actively improving relations and encouraging cooperation should be adopted instead of a realistic and failed strategy of trying to force the DPRK to abandon its nuclear weapon program, uh, program through sanctions and pressure. The DPRK has been using the period of increased sanctions and stalled a negotiation as an opportunity to further develop nuclear weapons. Moreover, it should be noted that severe sanctions that ban even the importing of needles in a pandemic era and the blocking trade in daily necessities has had a um, catastrophic humanitarian impact. Secondly, the denuclearization of Korean Peninsula uh, needs to be pursued through practical and comprehensive peace negotiation that also reduce mutual military stress in both directions. As of 2020, the annual military expenditure of South Korea amounted to 1.5 times total GDP of North Korea. The worst scenario on which uh, the ROK and the US base their joint military exercise involves a provocative plans such as preemptive strikes, massive punishment and retaliation, and the occupation and stabilization of the DPRK. So the end of the Korean War, the establishment of a peace treaty and the improvement of DPRK-US relations should be prerequisite or at the very last, binding parallel conditions for the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, rather than as a result of the denuclearization of uh, North Korea. Thirdly, the meaning of the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula should be clarified. It should be interpreted as making the Korean Peninsula a nuclear weapon-free zone by not only uh, dismantling the DPRK nuclear programs, but also dismantling the US nuclear option on the Korean Peninsula and the ROK military strategy that relies on the US nuclear umbrella. Finally, the parties to the negotiation must make genuine and concerted efforts to resolve uh, the nuclear conflicts on the Korean Peninsula. 
the more they delay or marginalize the, uh, the negotiation with the uh, excuse of responding to US-China strategic competition, the more the DPRK nuclear material, uh, militarism will gain strength. Where do we begin? Spending, <clears throat> suspending the ROK-US joint military exercises and starting to revise an aggressive military strategy against the DPRK could be minimum incentive uh, needed to uh, bring the DPRK to the negotiation table. Adopting a symbolic declaration to end uh, of the Korean War and starting to improve relations could also be the beginning of seri uh, uh, serious negotiations. Among the sweeping sanctions against the DPRK, certain sanctions that affect people's livelihood should be lifted or eased. The most important precondition is that the US and RK, which possesses overwhelming nuclear and conventional military power, should take an initial step toward reducing tensions and building trust. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Yi Tae Ho, <laughs> for um, highlighting the situation in the Korean Peninsula and uh, the need to pursue a comprehensive peace negotiation. Uh, we know that this is one of the major um, peace uh, 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 landmarks that we continue to follow and to, uh, to put in our effort and we are in solidarity and continue in solidarity with you. Um, and thank you for that. At this point, um, we'd like to call on the last speaker for this, uh, for this panel, uh, Jasmine Owens. Um, I'd like to introduce Jasmine um, as the lead organizer and uh, policy coordinator for the nuclear weapons abolition program at Physicians for Social Responsibility. Jasmine, the floor is yours. Hi everyone. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying thank you to Joseph Gerson and Peace and Planet for giving me the honor to speak today among these very distinguished panelists. Over the course of this pivotal 10th NPT review conference, whenever that happens, when asked why the US has stalled on its Article 6 commitments, you will hear the US delegates claim that we must create the environment for nuclear disarmament and that such an environment does not yet exist. If we are to entertain this notion that there could be a perfect environment conducive to nuclear disarmament, what the US fails to take into account is that this environment will not magically appear out of thin air. It takes genuine and sustained effort to illustrate to adversaries and the world that we are fully committed to maintaining peace. The US has done no such thing. Instead, we have continued to modernize and upgrade our nuclear arsenal, something that is both a blatant disregard of our Article 6 commitments and serves only to encourage other nations to do the same. We have continued to stoke hostilities with Russia and China instead of committing ourselves fully to diplomacy, transparency, and confidence building measures. What we have in our midst is not just a failure to act, but a failure to lead and a failure to hold ourselves accountable. The US prides itself on being a global leader, and yet the only leading it has done is down the path toward a new nuclear arms race. Moving forward with a multi-year nuclear weapons modernization project while making little to no effort to ease tensions with our adversaries, these are not characteristics of a good leader. And if the US believes itself to be a leader, then it cannot act shocked and surprised when other nucle nuclear weapon states follow suit. And the same goes for Russia and China who also strive to be global leaders. We are sick and tired of hearing that the time is not right to focus on nuclear disarmament. We cannot afford to wait for some future mythical right time. The time to act is now. When the US says we must defer disarmament because the timing isn't right, 
This is not in the interest of the people, but of key stakeholders who benefit from maintaining these weapons to line their own pockets. It's time for the US to actually live up to its Article 6 commitments and make genuine efforts to move the needle closer to disarmament and not nuclear war. United States can adhere to Article 6 without unilaterally disarming all at once. This can be done by implementing a no first use policy, which is a simple yet powerful action the US can take to illustrate that it truly is committed to peace. Additionally, and most importantly, the United States must also work alongside other nuclear armed states to begin negotiating the total elimination of their nuclear arsenals. What gives me hope moving into 2022 and beyond is people like you. There are courageous and committed individuals all across the world who are holding the nuclear armed countries feet to the fire, standing up and saying, we've had enough. One such effort is the TPNW. The entry into force of the TPNW is a monumental achievement to bolster the NPT regime and say to the nuclear weapons states that we see right through your facade, that we will no longer sit idly by while you play games with our lives. What also gives me hope is the growing understanding that we must build an intersectional nuclear disarmament movement if we truly want to succeed. Here in the US, organizations like my own, Physicians for Social Responsibility, understand that we must create the links between nuclear weapons and more proximate security issues for everyday citizens, like the pandemic, because only then can we build support and start demanding access to resources and funds that belong to the people, but are currently being wasted on weapons that threaten the very existence of humanity itself. Only then can we leverage our power to force governments to listen to the people, not a few vested interests. As we enter a new year fraught with danger as far as the eye can see, we must remain hopeful. The entry into force of the TPNW was just the beginning. A seed planted that is growing quickly, spreading its roots across the world, becoming more powerful each day. We, the people, planted that seed, and we, the people, will watch it flourish, watch its beauty mesmerize us all, and wrap us into the folds of its leaves, giving us the support we need to continue this fight for a world free of nuclear weapons. Thank you. Um. Thank you uh, uh, for that uh, presentation, Jasmine. That's about it. We have our six speakers for the first panel. And I am looking at our time and um, we, I think, only have one uh, a space for one question because we don't want to take up the time of the next panel. And I, I think, uh, Oh, and also that um, at this point, uh, I'm looking at uh, the, the questions and mind you, we have 12 questions in all in our Q&A box. And um, at this point, I would say that we will uh, take up one of the questions that are being asked and uh, we'll see what we can do if we have space in the next, after the next panel. But uh, I don't know whether we can do that uh, later. Uh, so um, I think it is important to respond to a question that is being asked to, uh, uh, to Alexei Gromyko, I think. And I am looking for that right now. I think I've lost it, but it's... It has been answered, sorry. <laughs> oh no, okay. Uh, yeah, the question is uh, for Dr. Gromichael, please comment on the following statement common in Nordic countries now. Through its saber rattling policies, Russia has unwittingly become the strongest advocate for small countries to move under the US NATO nuclear umbrella? That's a question. Uh, Dr. Alexei? Oh, yes. Uh, well, thank you for the question. Uh, this is one of the stereotypes which uh, <clears throat> we hear quite uh, often, not just these days, but in the recent years and uh, decades. Uh, 
the problem uh, is that if you compare the uh, situation uh, nowadays with the situation uh, in the 70s or in the uh, 80s last uh, century, then uh, 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 <clears throat> for sure you will notice uh, that uh, Russia uh, since then, uh, since 30 years uh, ago has uh, uh, withdrawn uh, its armed uh, forces from uh, almost all sides and uh, military bases, which uh, the Soviet Union uh, had in its uh, uh, disposal. Now the 99% uh, of Russian military personnel is concentrated on uh, uh, the Russian soil, not on the soil of, uh, of other uh, countries, where the uh, Russian uh, military uh, personnel uh, uh, is uh, deployed uh, is uh, uh, in uh, uh, the countries uh, which uh, border uh, Russia, plus one uh, country which is quite close to uh, Russia, which is uh, Syria. So uh, I do not think that in the past 30 years, uh, the, you know, the military doctrine of uh, Russia or uh, the uh, huge decrease in its armed uh, forces in uh, armaments in both conventional and nuclear uh, systems may be of uh, any uh, real source of uh, danger. But uh, what has been going on in the past 30 years uh, has been the, uh, the uh, enlargement or the expansion of NATO uh, due to this uh, fact, not to the fact that Russia was uh, sending its troops to other uh, countries, now we have several states, which uh, uh, the several states, member states of NATO, which border uh, Russia, uh, and not just uh, the point is in their membership, but in the uh, infrastructure, uh, in the number of uh, tanks, uh, you know, mi uh, military uh, aircrafts and uh, personnel which are deployed on the border with uh, Russia, with its uh, exclave, uh, Kaliningrad, or on the borders with the Union State. This is the, uh, the, the Union State is the organization which includes Russia and, uh, and, and Belorussia. So uh, uh, the red line which Moscow put forward in the, in the, uh, at the end of uh, last year was very uh, simple. We uh, don't mind uh, what is the membership of NATO, but uh, uh, please uh, um, do not place uh, strike systems, uh, conventional or nuclear, near our uh, borders. And please uh, don't make uh, those states new member states of NATO, uh, which are ready to deploy such strike systems on their uh, soil. And if you uh, remember, uh, President uh, uh, Putin uh, tried, well, to uh, fancy a, a situation when, uh, for example, hypothetically, the Russian strike systems are uh, placed on the border with the United uh, States, for example, in Mexico or uh, Canada. And we remember how in 1962, the United States were ready to put the world on the uh, uh, on the brink of the nuclear war, uh, because uh, Russia was deploying, the Soviet Union was deploying its strike systems in uh, Cuba. So uh, Russia uh, ask, uh, asks a very simple uh, question: uh, If you put your strike systems in the proximity of Moscow or Saint Petersburg, then uh, uh, do you really uh, expect from us to believe? that this is not a sort of uh, threat to our country and that the further expansion of NATO is uh, simply, you know, uh, uh, is the uh, enlargement of uh, pacifist feelings and the uh, enlargement of the uh, area of uh, stability and peace. This is a, a very tight uh, situation we're in. And uh, we're happy there are many questions, <laughs> but we don't have to, the time to respond to all of the questions. I think that um, a way to answer 
the other questions would be through email or some other ways. Uh, uh, this is addressed to the organizers. Um, and I, 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 I wish uh, we could ask more questions, but I would like to turn over the moderation of the next uh, panel to Jaron um, so that we can proceed with uh, the other speakers. Yep, thank you, Cora. And I will try if, if time al allows it to pick up on a couple of the questions um, if, if it's possible. I've also seen that some of the speakers have already responded through the through the system directly to those who, who've asked the questions. Um, so yes, it's time for our second panel. Um, you, you all realize that our speakers and audience includes people um, joining from both the Americas and the Pacific at the same time. Um, and that has unfortunately uh, forced us to, to decide not to organize a break um, as it would push uh, our Asian participants even further into the night. Um, but as you can see, this conference is being recorded and all participants will receive a link to review it in their own time. Um, so feel free to take uh, a couple of minutes um, if nature calls. Um, you'll, you're, you're able to re review the conference um, afterwards. So now moving on to our next panel. Um, we have a series of speakers from, from regions as varied as Europe, Africa, South America, and the Middle East. And uh, with speakers from non-nuclear states, countries hosting nuclear weapons, countries owning nuclear weapons, and a country that has given up um, nuclear weapons. So I'm sure that together with me, you look forward to learning from this diverse set of perspectives. Um, and I'm Glad to hand it back over to Cora to introduce the first speaker. Cora. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> well, I've been, it is a privilege to introduce um, uh, a, um, a leading activist against the US uh, nuclear bomb stationed in Bushel, Germany. Uh, and uh, I'd like to call on Marion Kupker at this point to uh, give us uh, her thoughts. Yes, uh, thank you for having me. Um, as you can see in the back, I'm also working for the Fellowship of Reconciliation in Germany. Um, in Germany, our campaign is actually getting bigger and bigger. We're having now 75 organizations, groups, organizations, and um, we pressure um, with actions, but also with lobby work, our government um, to for our three demands, our goals. Uh, the one is that we want to have the US nuclear weapons being withdrawn here in Germany. There are about 20. Um, we want to stop the ongoing modernization or even uprising of nuclear weapons. Uh, the new B-6112 nuclear bomb, which just got into production in the United States. And for sure, we want Germany to um, yeah, sign and ratify the TPNW. Um, so what we were really successful with um, over the last years was our Mayors for Peace um, organization. They are more than 700 Mayors for Peace now. Uh, worldwide, we are on place two with it. We have the city appeal, which means that uh, more than 120 cities are part in it which means um, now, yeah, at least a quarter of our population is being represented in the demand to, to get rid of these nuclear weapons. Um, and also we have the parliamentarians um, who signed, there are more than 600 parliamentarians that they actually want the treaty to be signed as a, yeah, by our government. So um, maybe, Oh, I, I stay with the actions a bit. And we also have um, about 100 trials from the last recent years where people went onto the base in Büchel where we have the 20 nuclear weapons um, because by doing it, we're gonna have a trial and these trials uh, give us a possibility at least to try to bring international law into the court system because these 
weapons are actually illegal under international law and international law is above our German law. So these, this campaign um, we do since 2016. Um, so with these trials, we also achieved that 14 complaints have been done so far by the Constitutional Court. And since um, late last year, since November, we even have our first trial at the European Court on Human uh, Rights, um, because so far our court system has not acknowledged it. So by coming or uh, going a little bit back, uh, Germany, maybe most of you know, but hosts US nuclear weapons and German pilots, they get the order by the US president through NATO would have to drop these bombs. Um, and this is being called nuclear sharing in NATO. Um, so that means it's the same for Italy, Belgium, um, the Netherlands, who have a similar situation. And they also are actually waiting for new nuclear weapons and new nuclear planes uh, for the next new years. So um, when, I, when we're looking at the NPT, um, then Germany is violating um, basically two articles. It's article second, which doesn't allow Germany as a non-nuclear weapon state to receive nuclear weapons from another one, in this case, the United States. Um, article one is being violated by the US handing it over to us. And article number six, which means that our government actually has a responsibility to get rid of nuclear weapons, to negotiate on it, um, yeah, and take active steps. And um, actually that's not what they are doing. I give an example, the nuclear uprise with the B-61 is an expansion of nuclear weapons and it's not dismantling. Um, and yes, as I said before, these weapons are illegal in general. Um, so maybe you heard about that since our last um, German white government election last um, September, we are having for the first time um, and we call it ample coalition, which means uh, the Green Party, the Democratic Party and the Liberal Party are in power. It's not anymore the um, Conservative Party. And we have from the Green Party, the female leader, she's now our foreign minister. And there were coalition negotiations. So we were hoping for getting some success um, with getting rid of these nuclear weapons. Um, the only thing we could achieve is um, that our foreign minister decided um, to join as an observer um, the yeah, states, member states negotiations in November um, in Vienna. March. Oh, March, yes, right. Um, so besides that, um, in the coalition, negotiations, um, the nuclear weapons in, in Büchel are not being mentioned, uh, but it's mentioned that new nuclear carry, carrier fighter is going to be uh, bought uh, from the US um, very soon, So, which we actually believe it's going to be about $9 billion what they're going to cost. I don't know how many minutes I've left. There's no think, clock yes. here. <laughs> Thank you, Marianne. I think you're through your time. Um, and congratulations on your, your major mobilization in Buchel earlier this year, mm -hmm. um, where the US weapons are stationed. This has raised um, awareness across all the newer generations in Europe uh, about the practice of nuclear sharing, and it is critical activism. So thanks to you and your colleagues. And let's mm -hmm. hope that the new government coalition and foreign minister offer new hope. In addition to um, your achievement of um, uh, getting a, a commitment to observe the meeting of state parties in Vienna, being a Belgian citizen myself, I know this is uh, very helpful to influence our governments to, to do the same. So thanks a lot. Um, I'm moving 
uh, to Africa, um, to our friend and colleague, Matthew Parks. He's the parliamentary coordinator for the Congress of South African Trade Unions. Um, and in that capacity, he coordinates engagement with the parliament uh, and the government and the African National Congress on Policy and Regulation. And at the National Economic uh, and Development and Labor Council, as well as bilaterally, he engages with companies and industry bodies on behalf of South African workers. He has long been involved in the ANC and its various formations and structures and built up a lot of experience with pushing through peace and disarmament policies. Matthew, welcome. Um, we look forward to listening to you from Cape Town. Okay. Um, yeah, good afternoon, uh, colleagues and friends and comrades. Um, so I guess maybe from South Africa, we've got a slightly uh, unique uh, position on the whole nuclear weapons issues. Uh, let me just say as COSATU, the Congress of South African Trade Unions, uh, we represent about 1.6 million workers and 17 individual unions. Um, these organize in all economic sectors, but in particular for this conversation, they also organize in the security sector, um, in, the, in the security industries, um, including the nuclear sector. Uh, COSATU has been part of South Africa's liberation movement and an alliance with the ANC since its founding in 1985. And COSATU, like its alliance partners and its predecessors, were always opposed to South Africa's apartheid regime's nuclear weapons program. Um, I think currently right now, South Africa, like other countries across the world, um, we are facing our deepest recession in a century. Unemployment has surpassed 46% during this period of COVID-19. We've seen millions of workers losing their jobs and their wages. We feel really that the, there's a need for the world to be focused on creating jobs, saving lives, not on investing in nuclear weapons. Um, our nuclear weapons colleagues were developed by the former party regime in secrecy during the Cold War. Um, with Matthew, the... sorry to interrupt you, but you, we've lost your visual. If there's any way you can fix it, it would be uh, great to see you. Yes, you're back. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. So, so, so South Africa's uh, nuclear weapons were, were developed during the Cold War with this kind of the blessings of the West, um, the active support of Israel and so forth. But uh, in our democratic negotiations um, up until 1994, between 1990 and 1994, the nuclear weapons were, were disposed of. Um, the then party regime quietly disposed of it and announced it afterwards. There was significant pressure on them to do so by the United States. I think partly out of fear because the ANC had historically had very close relationships with the former Soviet Union. But I think also to say that uh, the ANC and COSATU and most of society do not have a problem with disposing of nuclear weapons. We had never supported, we thought it was an unnecessary thing and we were glad to see them go. Um, the nuclear weapons industry in South Africa had also been used to threaten the liberation movements which were fighting for the independence and for the freedom and democracy of the region. They were also used to bully the neighboring states like Zambia, Tanzania, Angola, Mozambique against supporting the liberation struggle. Um, I could think to say maybe kind of two other key things that since we became a democracy in 1994, we've had no interest in developing nuclear weapons again. The sole space for nuclear in South Africa currently is part of our energy mix. We, we have a nuclear power station. Um, we are debating should we be expanding nuclear energy capacity in that regard, but for peaceful purposes. And of course, on the health front, we use nuclear technology um, for cancer treatment and so forth. I think this is one of the things which politically there's consensus in South Africa for, um, that we have no need for nuclear, nuclear weapons. Um, I think maybe the last thing to say is that um, our viewpoint is that South Africa is a model of how you can get away, how you can dispose of nuclear weapons, how there's no need for it. Um, our focus from a security perspective has been, how do we contribute towards peacekeeping in Africa um, we're quite an active participant in the United Nations, African Union, peacekeeping missions across Africa, from the Congo to Burundi, to Mozambique, to Comoros, to Sudan. How do we use our security forces to support um, other countries during periods of disaster, like the floods in Mozambique? How do we use our defense force to support um, our neighboring countries like Mozambique again, who are battling a terrorist insurgency in the North? So we've really seen a shift a peaceful shift um, away from the sector, but also there is a need to, to understand that you have workers who have jobs in these sectors, the Defense Force, 
um, who you do need to have a just transition for these workers, for the families, for the industries to move from weapons of war to uh, weapons of peace to industries of peace. So I think for us, lastly, I think I heard a bell ringing. Um, we think right now the focus of the world should be around creating jobs, saving lives, investing in peace, not investing in nuclear weapons. And we will support the call for all countries to embrace a nuclear non-proliferation treaty. Um, there can be no more sane call than to do so. So let me stop there and hope I do not exceed my time. Thanks. Thank you, Matthew, uh, and uh, for sharing um, your situation in uh, South Africa and the important perspectives uh, that you are bringing into this uh, uh, discussion uh, in this conference uh, today. Um, let me now, um, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to keep myself from, from making a lot of comments. So I'd like to immediately introduce Maria Pia Devoto, um, who is the director of the Argentinian Organization Association for Public Policies and a specialist in international security and non-proliferation issues. Disarmament, arms control, and gender and conducting advocacy activities and um, a lot of other, other concerns uh, that she can, uh, she is involved in. So Maria Pia, please. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are. First, I want to thank the organizers the opportunity to share my thoughts and learn from all these remarkable speakers on their thoughts on this topic. We should be these days in the beginning of the NPT review conference, but it was postponed again and again, as we know, and uh, there's no doubt that we are living challenging times, but uh, and, and not only because of the COVID, but uncertainties and uh, the lack of, of it's impossible to plant everything is not helping the world to advance on nuclear disarmament. And we know that there is a nuclear disarmament framework and we recognize the NPT as the main pillar. The treaty was conceived to prevent nuclear proliferation. We can say that in that succeed, guide nuclear disarmament, of course, not succeed, and develop and cooperate cooperate on nuclear energy under the supervision of the IAEA is always difficult, the name of this agency. And with a lot of efforts, we think that we can consider that uh, it, it succeeded for, for some time. We uh, follow very close the Iran's case. So as you know, I'm, I'm uh, or as you may know, I'm from Argentina and South America and my region, Latin America and the Caribbean region are unanimously recognized as leader on humanitarian disarmament. And nuclear disarmament is not deception. We witnessed nuclear tests and the Cuban missiles that it was uh, mentioned earlier, missile crisis on, on October 1962 was a direct and dangerous confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union uh, during the Cold War. And was the moment when two superpowers came closest to a nuclear conflict. So because of this and the tests as well, with the Mexican leadership, my region negotiated the Tlatelolco Treaty and, and it became the first nuclear free zone, even before the adoption of the NPT. In conversation with uh, about expectations of the NPT Review Conference with Ambassador Solbir and the president of the NPT Conference, as you know, it's an, an, a, a, an Argentinian diplomat and an expert and a very well-known and very responsible one. He said that he is pursuing a meaningful and fruitful outcome, but not only fruitful, also meaningful. And uh, he wanted to discuss every single article of the treaty. So I su suspect that fruitful and meaningful is not the same for some countries than for us or, uh, or of the president. So um, what we talk, what we learned after all these years is that nuclear powers will continue hiding uh, them on the belief that they have the right to possess nuclear weapons. And this was given by the NPT, the supposed right. 
So what we can do to change this nuclear de deterrence is still important for some countries, but what we can do. So first, continue advocating in every country in the world, those, but in, in particular, those that protected by nuclear weapons. So I've, 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 I've heard very interesting like uh, campaigns and, and efforts in, in these countries. So we continue doing this and call countries commit with nuclear disarmament to put pressure to enforce every article of the NPT in the review conference, especially in, in nuclear disarmament. And, and enlarge, it was mentioned, of course, earlier, enlarge the membership of the treaty on the provision of nuclear weapons. So we know we are more, we're one voice, we only need to speak louder. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Pia, with your contributions from Argentina and with uh, your views on how the nuclear free zone came about uh, in the region. It should continue to, to inspire others, in particular in the Middle East. We'll have a couple of speakers from that area uh, later on in this session. And uh, why not in Europe? Um, Alain, uh, who is from France, um, is the next speaker. He's the National Secretary of the Mouvement de la Paix uh, and in charge of in the international relations. Um, he's executive secretary of the International Association of Educators for Peace and co-chairs the French Teachers for Peace. Alain, uh, as yes. Europe is looking for more geopolitical independence, France is a key country that will define strategic decisions for the region. How does the French peace movement look at the year to come? Over to you. Yes. Thank you for giving me the floor. Uh, I represent, as you said, the French Mouvement de la Paix. And uh, it means I come uh, from a country which unfortunately has never played a positive role in the previous uh, NPT review conferences. Perhaps you don't know that France signed the NPT only in 1992. It means 22 years after its entry into force. And the successive uh, French presidents have never questioned the doctrine of nuclear deterrence. Uh, and they justify all the possession and permanent modernization of the French nuclear weapons. It's hard to believe, but the issues of nuclear weapons and uh, of uh, nuclear deterrence are never debated in the French parliament. It's only the decision of the presidents. And we are constantly told the same propaganda about our independence and security and so on. And despite the media's wall of silence on these issues, the majority of the French people declares itself in favor of nuclear disarmament. A July 2018 poll indicates that 67% uh, of French people want France to actively engage in the process of banning nuclear weapons in accordance with the commitments contained in Article 6 of the NPT. The majority of our people is against the modernization of the nuclear arsenal and in favor of the ban treaty. And our role, our responsibility as peace activists is to make this demand be, expread, be expressed even more strongly. Today we are confronted with immense uh, with immense crisis, uh, you know, them pandemic and climate and inequalities and so on. And uh, in such a situation, we need our government uh, concentrate all means, financial, economic, intellectual, scientific and technological means in favor of the well-being of the peoples and not in favor of the nuclear um, arsenal. We expressed this demand in the streets in France last September 25th, 
by organizing marches for peace, climate, and social justice in dozens of cities and villages in France. And we will do it again at the, at the next weekend on January 9 in Brest, in Brittany, where the actual French presidency of the European Union will bring together the 27 defense ministers and the 27 foreign after ministers. It means uh, 54 ministers of the European Union all together in Brest, in Brittany, and they, they want to speak about a European army and about militarization of the EU. Uh, it's uh, the French president is calling for this uh, military Europe and for new arms spending. And uh, at a time when our hospitals and where our, when uh, our social protection systems are in a state of collapse. Uh, in this mobilization and also in the debate for the next presidential election, presidential election in, in April in France, and after that in June, parliament election, we ask that France play a positive role in the uh, next review conference. And uh, we want that France also participate as like Germany now, as an observer in the next conference of state parties to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, TPNW in Vienna in March 2022. Only uh, by working uh, actively against nuclear weapons uh, can, uh, can our country adopt the current policy it would give uh, itself the means to work for climate, for social justice, for human rights and peace. And we will uh, use the uh, electoral campaigns to highlight uh, these issues because uh, we are convinced that it's necessary uh, to put constant pressure on decision makers and institution at all levels parliamentary, local level, and national level. Dear friends, uh, we think uh, in the Mouvement de la Paix, we believe that our visibility is not high enough at the national level, but also uh, at the international level. I think we need more unity, more visibility. We need more common mass actions, more common expressions, of the international peace movements. Uh, perhaps uh, the UN day for the elimination of nuclear weapons each year on September 26 could be used by all peace movements to call for a global day of action against nuclear weapons on the same date around the world. If we are to achieve our goals, we must be concerned with making our initiatives more convergent. That's our uh, commitment. Uh, and to conclude, uh, I would like to remember uh, Desmond Tutu, the Nobel, Prize, uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner who has just passed away. He said, hope is being able to see the light despite the darkness. We have the darkness, so let's keep hope. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. Uh, and, um, you know, noting your uh, strong call for more visibility, more international action. I think we are all listening to that and your call for a global day of action against nuclear weapons, something that we need to pursue in the future. So thank you. And at this point, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Emad uh, Kiyeh. I'm not sure whether I pronounce it right. Emad is uh, the director of the Middle East Treaty Organization, 
which seeks to er eradicate all weapons of mass destruction from the Middle East through innovative policy, advocacy, and uh, educational programs. So Ahmad, you have the virtual floor, please. Thank you so much, and it's a pleasure to be here. It's uh, very easy to cover the Middle East in five minutes, so I will do my best. Um, as has been the introduction, the Middle East Treaty Organization seeks to advance the prospects for a WMD free zone in the Middle East. And uh, to give you some good news, we have made a lot of progress while the rest of the world has been in COVID uh, with the latest uh, conference, the second one of the UN General Assembly led a uh, conference on the WMD free zone that, occur that occurred in New York at the end of November, uh, the second one. And of course, we all know that the establishment of the WMD free zone in the Middle East is connected to the real fact of why we're all here, the, the indefinite extension of the NPT. The 1995 indefinite extension called for uh, concrete steps to be taken to the establishment of the zone. And this is one of the criteria of why we have this indefinite extension. So it's primary in our work and it's fundamental to the uh, continuation of having an NPT that is operating. Now, in the Middle East, we are facing a lot of challenges and uh, I'm sure that it's one of the um, last places on the planet that we can expect a zone free from all weapons of mass destruction. And mind you, it will be the first one in the world that goes beyond the nuclear weapons free zones that we have already heard about being the first one in South America that we have learned a lot from uh, and lessons learned from that process to insert into our work in advancing the zone issue. Now, the zone itself will be massive, a vast geographical area of 15 million square kilometers. And this wrap our head around that would be one and a half times the size of the United States. It will include 22 Arab countries, plus Iran and Israel. It will stretch all the way from Iran to the Mauritania in the west, uh, to Western Sahara, south as the Comoros Islands. So it's going to be a vast territory in, uh, incorporating more than half a billion people. So there's a lot of challenges in that in itself. In addition to that, we have um, uh, heightened uh, awareness obstacles that are facing the region, may that be political, technical, environmental, and these, of course, all make it even more difficult. But here's the bottom line. The bottom line is that for us to establish a WMD free zone in the Middle East, we are proposing and we are advancing and supporting a treaty-based approach. And that has three key components. One is a treaty itself, a text freely arrived at by the governments of the region through an inclusive process, a regional organization, a body that will oversee the treaty's eventual implementation, verification, and compliance, very similar to other uh, regional organizations or international organizations that oversee the implementation of different treaties, like the IAEA does that for the NPT, let's say. And um, we have, for example, the OPCW for the CWC. And of course, a third pillar of our approach is a, a robust civil society engagement. And we believe that that's important and paramount for it to become a reality. This is where the meta comes in. We've touched on, on all those three areas. We said, okay, we need a treaty, we're gonna write it. We're gonna write one, it's gonna be a draft. It's gonna remain a draft, but it's gonna be evolving. And it evolves in accordance to what is happening in the region and how we can then insert it into the formal diplomatic processes that are happening. Those diplomatic processes are basically twofold. One is the one that is going through the United Nations uh, General Assembly, this annual conference, and the other is through the NPT, because again, as I said, it's connected so intricately to the indefinite extension. So we have these two parallel dem diplomatic processes, and META contributes to both through this uh, draft treaty process that incorporates uh, a lot of insight from experts and policymakers and diplomats and the personal capacity from the region and beyond. And we've also set up METO, which is the Middle East Treaty Organization, as the, basically the starting point of that regional organization that would then eventually become something much greater, bigger, and be able to enforce such a treaty once it's been signed on by governments. Now, amongst all of these things, in the civil society component of it, of course, we do a lot. And we do that through our webinars, uh, campaigning, advocacy, and so forth. But this is my message to all of you from across the world. 
that if we are going to achieve this zone that will have impact, not just in the Middle East, but beyond, we need the support of the international community in three ways. One, let the Middle East figure out its own problems and support the solutions that they come up with. So speak with the Middle East, not at the Middle East. Number two, support the initiatives that are already underway that support the zone. That's the November conference, that's the, through the NPT, that's through UNIDIR and METO, and help us achieve this through all of these means. That means that if you want to talk about the Middle East, if you want to learn more about what we do and how your messaging in the NPT review conferences as civil society or to your respective governments in relation to the zone and in the region, reach out to us because we are from the region and we can help you navigate this landmine of a region that is very difficult to understand even by us. But we have a little bit of a better idea and we hope that we can work together to make it happen. And my final point is make sure that you support the JCPOA. The revival of the Iranian nuclear deal is another key pillar to disarmament, non-proliferation in the region, not just for Iran, but it will stop and put a cap on the acceleration of other nuclear programs, maybe we're seeing it in the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and of course, Israel. With that, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Ahmad. <clears throat> it's good to know that there was uh, progress during the, the recent discussions on the nuclear weapons free zone. Uh, and it's great to see the, the treaty and international law approach. Unfortunately, the, the recent review conference postponement is, is Another illustration that currently governments seem to be unable and unwilling to tackle global threats through multilateralism. So all the more your success is, uh, is I think, crucial to lift ambitions in other regions. Uh, and we all continue to support your important work and support your call for uh, self-determination in the region. Um, we now stay in the region uh, to move to Sharon Dolev, who is co-founder and executive director of the Middle East Treaty uh, Organization and an Israeli campaigner for the uh, Nobel Peace Prize winning international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, ICANN. She is peace and human rights activist with a focus on eradicating nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction from the Middle East through innovative policy, education, advocacy, and activism. And she is the founder and director of the Israeli Disarmament movement. Sharon, it's great to have you on this panel. The uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Yoron. I, thought, I, I hope I, I pronounce your name and, uh, so, uh, and it's so great to be with all of you and see some of uh, the faces that we usually meet in conferences um, here over Zoom. So thank you for Peace and Planet for organizing this. Um, Imad actually described uh, what METO is calling the states or asking from states very precisely. The, and there's not much I can, uh, I can add to that. But I do want to focus on what is it that we civil society say uh, to our states, to other states, what is it that we're calling for when we're talking about the NPT uh, and when we're talking about the Middle East and the NPT. And I think that um, Usually, it's, it, is, um, it is very usual for, for the West to talk about, about the Middle East without the Middle East, and it's less common to invite a Middle Eastern to say what he thinks should happen between Russia and, um, and the US. Uh, but, but I will say something about that. I think that as campaigners, we should, rally, uh, we, we should really like the NPT. This is the one place where the nuclear armed states are actually sitting in the room under an obligation to disarm Article 6. I think that what we do, um, what we don't do enough is to call on a timeline on that, is to campaign within the nuclear armed states. Now, in the Israeli disarmament movement, we have come to a re realization that while we can scare the people efficiently, from nuclear war, from any future nuclear war, we don't have a solution to offer them when it comes to Israel disarming. And that's actually the reason that METO came to life, a regional organization that gives a regional solution. I think that it's time for us campaigners from around the world to find the same solutions, what might bring the nuclear armed states to the table, 
uh, five of them are sitting at the NPT. Now, the last NPT review conference ended without a final document. The reasoning for no final document was a state that was not even in the room, Israel. Now, how can it be that a state that is not in the room can affect the NPT? That shows a lack of goodwill. The nuclear armed states didn't want to talk about the Ben Treaty. They didn't want to talk about the humanitarian uh, consequences of nuclear war, and they couldn't reach any agreement. So they turned their eyes and hands to the NPT, to, to the Middle East at the last two days, so they can say that uh, that there is no uh, a final document because of the Middle East, because Israel uh, won't join the NPT as a non-nuclear armed state. Now there are states in the room and they can uh, achieve some good decisions. One of the decisions that we should push for is that the Middle East shouldn't be touched uh, at this upcoming review conference because, uh, the, because the Middle East is, um, is being taken care of with the November conference. So it's not an NPT decision. Uh, it's, not, it's not an NPT process, sorry, but it is a UN decision that is um, close enough to the 95 uh, resolution to be sufficient enough for the states in the room to just support. What the states can do is to assist um, the states within the region with hosting some of the roundtables and some of the intersessional work to continue and work on a draft text or on a text um, that gives answer to the thematic themes that the states in the room, the, the Arab states and Iran in the room, brought up as things that needs to be solved. Now, as civil society, we found solutions to some of their uh, issues, and it is up to us to continue and find what the problems might be and find solutions uh, ahead and offer it. We can't do it without the international um, assistance because uh, some of us don't speak to some other states. I mean, to have a conversation in within the Middle East on weapons of mass destruction is almost impossible. But for us, apart from asking campaigners and states to start talking about Article 6 much more than they talk about the Middle East or about the state that is not in the room, uh, for us, it is crucial to remember something that even us in the Middle East Treaty Organization overlooked. And that was what is security in the Middle East, because one of the delays or one of the reasons that there will be delays on the talk is exactly because of uh, because of regional security and because of the link of uh, uh, means of delivery um, to the to the whatever solution that needs to come up at the November conference. So what we're starting to do now is remap what is security to the Middle East. It is a new project. Um, I, we think that it's um, exciting. We invite you to join us. Um, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, you know, uh, after listening to Emad and Sharon, I think um, our next speaker and also our final speaker would be one who would be the appropriate speaker to close the uh, this panel. And I, at this point, I'd like to call on Tarja Kronberg, uh, a distinguished um, uh, associate, a fellow with the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. And she is currently working on the Middle East with the objective to reduce tensions and to create conditions for dialogue. I think it is um, a way of, you know, kind of uh, reinforcing the thoughts and, uh, and reflections coming from Imad and Sharon. Tarja? Thank you all. <clears throat> and I think this discussion is a very good discussion to start the year 2022, which probably will not be, will be very turbulent and, and not, not so peaceful as, as we hope. But I would like to, in, in the context of the Middle East, also address the sort of bigger question of, of the future of the NPT as the last speaker. And uh, I think we can see today that 
no, there's really a lack of innovative thinking about the NPT. There are two groups, the ditchers who want to ditch the NPT and, and see it as a, as a discriminatory uh, treaty where some countries may keep nuclear weapons and others have to abstain. And we have the keepers who feel that the NPT is the last arms control treaty and it has to be kept as such and it would be terrible to, to destroy it. So between these, these two extreme positions, I actually advocate a question of renegotiating the NPT and looking at how this could be, why it should be done and who should do it. And this is, I just wrote a book on renegotiating the nuclear order. So it is based on, on, on research in this field. Two reasons for why the NPT would need to be renegotiating, negotiated, and, and those two reasons are related to actually changes within the NPT right now. And one is that the disarmament norm, the, the first one is a clash of norms. The NPT has been based on the disarmament norm. It has been the glue that has held the NPT together. How could otherwise some people have nuclear weapons, other abstain? And, and now this has, there is another norm, which is the prohibition norm, which is much stronger. The TPNW has sort of achieved this new norm. And this has pushed the nuclear weapon states actually to argue and defend for deterrence. If you know that deterrence is actually totally invisible in the NPT, it's not one of the three pillars. It's not one of the grand bargains. It is totally invisible. Now, because of the prohibition of this uh, de deterrence and disarmament, the conflict between deterrence on the one hand and disarmament and prohibition on the other hand has become the focus. And actually this is a conflict that cannot be solved within the NPT. So, any solution has to go outside, renegotiate, and look at future solutions. The second reason is the one that has been mentioned here several times. The fact that the legitimacy of the NPT can be really questioned. The TPNW does it on the disarmament, the Article 6. We have just heard the British explanation about how uh, the country is increasing nuclear weapons and is actually in breach of the NPT. The US has been in breach of the NPT with its uh, cooperation agreement with India. And we also see that now with the AUKUS in Australia, knowledge about nuclear driven submarines is transferred to other countries. So there's also other uh, legitimacy problems in, in the in the NPT, I have looked at the question of the inalienable right. And you can see that from the original understanding that this is um, only about producing the nuclear weapons, not the infrastructure, you can find that there are a lot of things that are restrictions that now reach the infrastructure, uh, re, re, uh, what do you say, uranium enrichment and plutonium reprocessing. So the legitimacy is a question. And <clears throat> now the question is, and I have, this is the sociological approach, approach. I have looked at all the states, the nuclear weapon states and, and the non-nuclear states and seen where is the greatest potential for change? Where could, who could actually take initiative to renegotiate the NPT? And the nuclear weapon states will not take the initiative, I think we would easily agree on this. But there is a group of non-nuclear states and it is the nuclear, uh, the states in the nuclear weapon free zones. The majority of the world states, states that have double commitment to nuclear free status. States that have a, are organized regionally, they lack a global organization, but this could be uh, achieved and, and they are, in a way they have a common interest. And this common interest is the question of unconditional legally based negative security assurances. They don't exist today. 
there are some protocols which are not signed, some are not ratified. They were supposed to be in the NPT in the initial phases of the NPT negotiations, they were excluded. So the nuclear weapon free zones together, they could actually uh, threaten to withdraw from the NPT and press for unconditional uh, negative security assurances that would be legally based. And my proposal here is, is that this would be the first step. This would actually mean that the nuclear weapon states, they cannot take that uh, countries, 100, over 100 countries would threaten or maybe even withdraw from the NPT. So they would have to accept a renegotiation. And in the context of the renegotiation, you could pose other problems. The P5 was supposed to be have the temporary right for nuclear weapon, free, uh, nuclear weapon status. Should it be continued? The question of the inalienable right, should it be defined? And what about the TP and W? Should it be the disarmament part of the uh, nuclear order? And maybe the, it would be enough for the NPT to be only the non-proliferation part. So these questions could be posed in this context. And there are some advantages, and I would just like to cite few. One would be that the fact that there would be unconditional negative security assurances for all nuclear weapon-free zones, this would actually promote the establishment of the zones. And it could maybe also solve some of the problems in the Middle East. A second thing would be that if all the nuclear weapon-free zone were outside of deterrence, were actually secured that they would not be threatened or attacked by nuclear weapons, it would mean that the geographic, um, geographic area available for deterrence would be smaller and smaller. And the question is, of course, what would happen in the case that it would be only the uh, three superpowers, China, Russia, and, and the US that could deter each other? I will leave this here, but I would actually think that there's some change that are needed. And I think the nuclear weapon free zone states are the possible change agent. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tarja, for uh, your out of the box thinking uh, about the future of the MPT. It surely uh, put some original and new ideas into the, the discussion, which as, as you mentioned it at the beginning, uh, might be crucial to un unblock the stalemate that we're all facing uh, so long already. So I think we have only a, just a couple of minutes for, um, for questions and answers. And I may come back to you, Tarja, with a particular one, uh, indeed on the relation between the NPT and the Nuclear Ban Treaty. Um, but before opening it up, I see that Sharon has raised her hand. So I'm going to ask her whether she wanted to add something to her uh, intervention. Uh, no, no, it's totally by accident. All right. Well, <laughs> that's good. Um, and I wanted to uh, pick up on a couple of the, well, maybe we won't have time for a couple of questions. But one question that was addressed actually uh, at the time of the earlier um, session to the trade union speakers, that would be Liv and Matthew uh, over the session um, from the Women's International League for Peace uh, and Freedom about um, how uh, trade unions can stop members from working in the nuclear weapons industry. Um, it's a question that uh, we're faced with uh, regularly. Um, and uh, Cheryl from the Women's League says that if engineers will not help to design these weapons, they will not be viable. And so I'll hand it over to Matthew, if he's still online, to share a bit of reflections from the South African trade union on this. Um, okay, no, thank, thanks, Jaron. I mean, I think it's, it's a couple quick things, or no, <laughs> simple things, rather. Um, I think one is nuclear weapons are government-controlled industries, so they're not private sectors. So the simplest, quickest, the most important solution is for governments simply to close down those nuclear weapons programs. If the industries don't exist, 
people won't work in them. Those are government controlled institutions. So it's not like a coal power station, which can be private or public, for example. Um, the second is to have a just transition for those workers, those communities, those scientists, those engineers, those industrial value chains to convert them from nuclear weapons programs to nuclear energy, to nuclear medicine, nuclear research or peaceful industries. Um, but also I think it's critical also to create alternative economic industries. It might be outside of nuclear industry itself. So it could be renewable energy, it could be electric vehicles. But the point is anybody needs to have a job. Or if, you do, if you allow such skilled people not to have jobs then they'll be poached by other countries. I think lastly, uh, we've seen other countries poach such nuclear experts for illegal nuclear weapons re regimes in North Korea, um, Syria, Pakistan, etc. I think we've all seen it over the years. And I think the last point is that South Africa after 1994 had to actually, the government had to actually make sure that those persons in South Africa who have nuclear weapons expertise don't go to other countries like Libya, etc. They had to actually tell them, we'll employ you here, we'll pay you a very uh, wealthy salary, but also that they also use the stick as well, that we're going to confiscate your passport. You'll not be allowed to leave those countries. And we're going to make sure that you stay in South Africa because this is our contribution to keeping the world safe, not allowing such a highly sought after expertise to be taken to for wrong use. So I think it's for me, it's those kind of interventions. But thanks, Jerome. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, and I saw Liz uh, with her hand up, so I'll allow her to add a few thoughts, but I'll also add a new question. Liv, before you speak. Um, that's from Halle. Uh, Larry Holman, um, how can we promote mutual trust between nations in order to facilitate the willingness to subordinate individual national interests to the interests of all nations combined? Can you take both uh, questions at the same yeah. time? Thank you. Let me start with uh, the workers question. And I'll try not to, to repeat what my Kusato comrade was, was underlining. You know, right now we have thousands and thousands of people who are desperate to keep their jobs because uh, their mere survival depends on it simply. So I think it's important to, to underline that security policy and defense policy is a government responsibility. And as Kusato was saying here and Matthew was saying, I mean, this is a government, it's state run enterprises. Um, now, I do think it's important that the unions are very clear on disarmament and the aims to build peace and disarm. But uh, we need to have also a just transition plan in place in order to, to move people over to green, clean, decent jobs instead of what they are producing now, because there's no doubt that, that not only is nuclear weapons an existential threat, but it's also diverting resources from other tasks that are in huge demand and need right now in particular. Um, so uh, let, me, let me leave it at that. Uh, on national, national, building national trust or international trust, I do believe dialogue and platforms are crucial. Uh, I do think trust building in a global perspective is, is a hugely complex issue. And we're basically talking about rebuilding a trust and the multilateralism that has been undermined by many countries and many leaders for many years. So it's not gonna be done in, in, in a very sort of short time. It's gonna take time, but establishing platforms and dialogue and underlining again and again, that dialogue and multilateralism is actually in everyone's interest is important and making sure that the platforms are actually there and the conferences take place and not continuously are being delayed, postponed, uh, not happening uh, is crucial. And I do believe lastly, that the pressure from civil society is crucial. 
Uh, right now, we see polarization in civil society as well, which is not good. Uh, with civil society in many countries focusing on their own national interests in, in uh, contradiction to others, uh, their own country first, they're going more and more nationalistic in some countries. So the more we can build dialogue inside civil society and put pressure on our governments to actually follow the same dialogue principles, I think is of crucial importance right now. Okay, thank you very much. And, and I truly apologize to the other speakers that we won't have more time. Um, but Liv, I think you take us to the, the final section of this uh, conference. Um, not without uh, thanking Joseph and Mariana for all the hard work that they've done to organize this conference. I'll hand it over to them to briefly introduce a statement that was prepared that we can indeed use to make sure that uh, our movements push governments uh, to not indefinitely postpone uh, the, the MPT conference and to make sure that we keep moving forward rather than backward. So from my side, thanks to all of you for uh, allowing me to be your co-host and a special thanks to my colleague, uh, Cora, for today for great cooperation. Joseph, the floor is yours. You're muted, Joseph. Sorry about that. Get the, what I've got here. So thank you, Jerome. And I want to thank our excellent speakers and everyone who has joined today's conference. Uh, what a great and uh, hopefully impactful conference we've had. Our goal has been not only to seek better understandings of the threats we face, but also to change policies and to remove uh, the threats of nuclear cataclysm. In anticipation of the now postponed NPT review conference, the Peace and Planet Network developed our conference statement, which you can find at the website, which we posted in the chat. Uh, when a firm date for the rescheduled review conference is set, the Peace and Planet Network will begin planning uh, our future initiatives. Let me summarize our statement and encourage all of you to take actions for nuclear weapons free, uh, peaceful, just, and, uh, and uh, sustainable climate uh, world. At the height of the Cold War, Bertrand Russell and Albert Einstein appealed to the world to remember your humanity and forget the rest. Today, the bolt in the atomic scientist doomsday clock is set at 10 seconds to midnight and warns that humanity stands at the brink of apocalypse due to the twin existential threats posed by nuclear weapons and climate change. Solutions to these threats are readily apparent. Fulfill the nuclear nonproliferation treaty's promise of a nuclear weapons free world and end the use of fossil fuels. The entry into force of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons is a landmark achievement. It demonstrates that the majority of the world's nations stand in judgment, even outrage, at the failure of the nuclear powers to fulfill their Article 6 NPT obligation to engage in good faith negotiations for the complete elimination of the nuclear arsenals. Trust has been further shattered by the nuclear weapons states failure to fulfill commitments uh, reinforced by agreements made uh, in the 1995, 2000, 2010 review conferences, including their unequivocal un undertaking to accomplish the total elimination of nuclear arsenals. The nuclear powers failure to fulfill their NPT obligations, their increasing investment in and reliance on nuclear weapons, their ongoing first use of nuclear warfighting doctrines and uh, development of overwhelming conventional high-tech weaponry encourage forces in other nations to seek their own nuclear deterrent, further increasing the dangers of nuclear catastrophe. Short of nuclear attacks, nuclear weapons devastate human lives because of radioactive poisoning from their production cycle and the diversion of essential human and financial resources from stanching the COVID uh, pandemic uh, to the climate, climate emergency and from hunger, homelessness, and hopelessness. We call for immediate fulfillment of Article 6 obligations and past NPT review agreements to abolish nuclear weapons. We call for US-Russian negotiations for deep reductions in the nuclear arsenals. We call for a halt in the development and deployment of all nuclear weapons and delivery systems, for significant reductions in spending 
uh, for nuclear weapons and related systems, for support in signing and ratification of the TPNW, and to end all nuclear sharing. We urge settlement of all conflicts through diplomacy and peaceful means based on the UN Charter and international law, for negotiations to fulfill the promise of the creation of a Middle East nuclear weapons free and uh, WMDZ uh, free zone, uh, and for common security diplomacy. We call on the world's movements to mobilize popular opinion and actions to pressure our governments to implement, support, and sign the TPNW and ratify the TPNW, to demand our governments to cut massive spending on nuclear weapons and militaries, and to increase multi-issue international civil society collaboration to build the political pressure to achieve a nuclear weapons free world. That's a lot, but we can do it. We need to live as if our commitment to life, to ourselves, to our families, our children, and everyone else is really uh, our deepest commitment. Uh, we need to live that uh, from day to day. Thank you. And with that, I guess with, with, with that, I guess it's my responsibility to again, thank everybody for joining us. Thank our speakers and MCs again, and to wish you uh, both good health and lots of good organizing as we go out into the world. Thank you so much, and we'll be following up. <laughs> and then I just I just need to apologize to to speakers and to Mariana and our, our MCs. Uh, I have to run off. Uh, for a, a kind of a routine but but important medical uh, uh, appointment. No problem, but I'll be gone the rest of the afternoon, but I will be sending appropriate thank yous. And everybody, well done. That was really well done. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We will send the recording. Thank you. Bye. Stay safe.